just uh, want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. We've got an awesome speaker uh, to share what's going on with the city of Minneapolis. And um, I just wanted to make a couple quick announcements before Kim starts. Uh, we are having the MRES Solar Boat Regatta this weekend on Saturday at Lake Riley in Eden Prairie. And this will be our 32nd annual regatta. And at this point, we have uh, either 13 or 14 teams. We're not sure exactly. <laughs> um, and we just want to you know, welcome everybody to that event. If you have time, it's just a wonderful experience. And I mean, you know, it's the type of regatta where the kids are actually in the boat. It's junior and senior high school students. And uh, like I say, from at least 13 schools around the area. And uh, uh, so anyway, if you can make it, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can go to our website, MN Renewables, and uh, check out uh, more information on it. Lake Riley is really easy to find. And uh, so try to make it if you can. The second thing I wanted to bring up is that MRES, as usual, for a number of years now, we were, we're going to be involved in the eco experience at the State Fair. And uh, as usual, we also need a lot of volunteers to help us make it happen, uh, usually in the area of 150 people. And so uh, please consider that if you have time. It's a fun experience of learning and sharing, um, you know, free, free t-shirts, free tickets, and uh, just a, a great opportunity to, uh, you know, do something for sustainability in a, a little different way on a more personal level. So, and with that, I wanna jump into the presentation here. Uh, Kim Havey is our speaker tonight. He's the uh, Director of Sustainability for City of Minneapolis. Uh, it's been there since I believe, Kim, I think it was 2018 that yes. you moved, moved over from Commerce. Right. And, uh, He's been a good friend for years and a good friend of MRES and a lot of things related to solar. And now he's doing an awesome job with the uh, sustainability efforts. And I make that plural <laughs> with the city of Minneapolis. Uh, so Kim, please take it from here. All right. Well, thank you, Doug. And uh, good evening, everyone. As Doug said, yeah, I really appreciate you taking time out to hear about what we're what we've actually been doing and also just to kind of catch everybody up um i think i was here two or three years ago and um and i was talking about some of our activities but since then and over the last a uh, little less than a year now but um we've passed a number of really uh big, big uh, changes in policy as well as new funding opportunities um, called the Climate Equity Plan and also the Climate Legacy Initiative uh, to support the implementation of the Climate Legacy Plan. So I'm going to run through what our current information is and how our plan lays out and then talk a little bit about some of the programs that we have going on too. All right, I'm going to have to see why my computer button is not going down. All right. Um, hmm. Sorry about that. What's working? It's happening now. Oh, there we go. So the Climate Equity Plan, and this is our, uh, uh, we had a, a Climate Action Plan developed in 2013. This is the updated 2023 version we got approved uh, late last year. We created a vision that really, I think, articulates where we want to go, which is achieving an environmentally just and resilient, low carbon and equitable city. So it's really about bringing our communities together uh, around this common cause that we all are facing, right? And so the, what, how we're going to uh, achieve that vision is through collaboration with our residents, nonprofits, businesses, and advancing environmentally just policies. So changing from the days of redlining and, and uh, putting, uh, you know, uh, coal plants in, in low income communities and, uh, you know, always having sort of the, the uh, heavy polluters near um, those black and brown communities. We want to reverse that those policies and improve those particular communities because we're going to be getting rid of all those types of things that cause a lot of uh, air pollution, noise, et cetera. And we want to make sure we start with those communities 
um, that have bared the brunt of that uh, uh, for the last, you know, uh, well, <laughs> thousand years, or at least the last hundred years of the industrialization era. Um, we really looked at this as an opportunity to advance equity and justice and the interconnection between a community's health and um, their wealth and the uh, sustainability of their communities is when we all get this together, right? So we want to have a Minneapolis that supports healthy living. We want one that has a wine uh, mindset of abundance and not scarcity. The idea that ever, there's only so big a pie and that so therefore if you don't get a bigger slice, someone else is going to get it. That's a mindset of scarcity. We actually have a lot of opportunity for this new transition. We have a tremendous amount of, of new wealth building opportunity. So this isn't about losing something, it's about gaining and growing something. And then we wanna live in a Minneapolis that is sustainable and continues to be sustainable over time, not just for a year or two and then things go back, but really be sustainable ongoing um, and be able to respond to um, and be resilient to the climate impacts that we are gonna be having. Um, the reality is we're not going to be able to, we will hit the, uh, you know, probably two, uh, two degrees Celsius at least by 2050. So we are going to feel the impacts. It takes 10 to hundred years to get rid of carbon out of the air. So it's like trying to, uh, stop a, you know, aircraft carrier. So we are going to experience, uh, climate effects. We already are our last winter. Right. Um, and so we need to be, uh, adaptable and resilient, uh, to those changes, and I was, interestingly, we had the National Adaptation Forum in St. Paul this week. So people from all over North America and, and got together to talk about how we can really now the focus is on use natural systems um, to be able to really create adaptable environments. So I think we're going to be seeing some beautiful improvements that are actually going to be able to handle the, you know, increase in, in heavy rains and to be able to better um, uh, clean water before it goes into our rivers and streams. So I think there's a lot of ex uh, excitement about that. But just big picture, um, this is uh, approximately our, our uh, GHG emissions. You know, it's about the same now in 2023. It takes us kind of a year lag to get this in, and this is from our plan. But ultimately, we've seen a lot of decrease in, in electricity. Uh, use. We've actually seen a fair amount uh, of decrease in on-road transportation. Uh, we've seen a, a slow but consistent increase in the use of natural or fossil gas and an increase in solid waste. Um, so <laughs> the, 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 the electricity and on-road transportation has some, some wind in the sails, uh, but we are fighting an uphill battle in fossil gas and solid waste. Wastewater is actually interesting going to be, become carbon neutral with a new one megawatt um, uh, solar installation up at the city's uh, plant up in Anoka. So one of the new things we put together for this particular um, uh, plan is that we use the latest science-based information. So before we were kind of just putting out a, we had a goal of 80% GHG reduction by 2050. We're now com uh, committing to carbon neutral. And as part of the international standards um, for sort of wealthier uh, cities specifically, those that have higher per capita income and higher GHG emissions per capita are being asked to really accelerate their uh, decarbonization. One, they have more money to be able to do it. And two, they polluted the air uh, for the last century, uh, you know, um, without having to have much, uh, any kind of environmental impact noticeable but now we're seeing it. Um, so we are committed to a carbon drawdown um, uh, consistent with our, our um, international protocols. And uh, this also includes a, a overall budget. As I said, the cumulative uh, impact of CO2 and methane are um, really, uh, it, it builds up and methane can sometimes uh, last 10 years CO2 sometimes 100 years, but the point is you can't just pull it back out again or it just dissipates quickly, not the case. So the new science is about a budget, the total amount of emissions. So that's what's represented under this, uh, in this darker blue line. And then and you can see that 
you know, if we continued on our path, which is the dotted line, we have been making good progress. I mean, we are 35% uh, down cumulatively from 2006. Uh, so we, we actually met our early goals. Um, but now we want it, we have to accelerate this knowing the new science. So this box is our total budget. And what it shows if we continue on our, our current trajectory a bit, it's going it while it's going down, uh, we will go through our total carbon budget, which means we'll be adding to the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, or, or adding above that based on uh, more emissions than we should have uh, for our community. <clears throat> This is I, there's a big lot of chart in here, but what it shows is really what I talked about earlier. We've seen a very significant decline in electricity. We've had about a 3% increase in fossil gas on road transportation down 22%. That has a, a pretty, so that's a pretty big impact. Solid waste, uh, you know, it really kind of shot up during COVID because this is where the stuff like Amazon ordering and and take out food goes. This 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 has been a pretty significant increase uh, as a result of a lot more sort of carry out and, and over uh, internet purchases. Wastewater, we've been making good progress. We already uh, put in a lot of efficiency and new pumps on there. So as you can see, we're down about 30% overall, but our overall uh, S-curve decline to carbon neutral um, is going to really start accelerating here. So um, in order to really be um, part of that uh, process, we also want to make sure we're focusing on some of the, the goals on that, not just GHG emissions, but equity centered goals as well that include energy efficient homes, starting in our environmental justice communities, eliminating uh, lead, radon, asbestos in homes, which has to be done before you can insulate it, upgrading uh, homes electrical systems so they can actually you got to have a 200 amp service, for example, and you can't have knob and tube wiring because that's like unprotected wires and walls with insulation, bad fire risk. So we have to do, we're really looking at getting the, the modernizing of, of these homes uh, and really trying to make them more efficient. We're focusing on cleaning up indoor air quality, uh, which actually has a bigger trigger source for asthma uh, than outdoor air quality. It's also something we have more control over. And it has become more, uh, really, really more important with all of this, uh, uh, you know, forest fire smoke that we're seeing. Because you really, you know, how do you deal with it externally? It's not from our country. Uh, but in turn, into the house, you can have filtration systems and certain kinds of fans that take things out. And you may have heard the idea of a safe room. You know, that was kind of like a big thing, whatever, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, where you got to have that locked off room in case there's like a, you know, band of burglars going to attack your house. Well, now what people are building in is safe rooms from the forest fire smoke that are highly filtered and are completely closed off so that you have can go there to get get your catch your breath. So really focusing on clean indoors has been a really big um, pivot that we've done on around air quality. Um, but externally, we're looking for more green space, trying to really get more uh, carbon-free transportation, um, continue to provide the highest quality clean water um, through our community and throughout a lot of the Western suburbs. And we have to be building a green workforce to be able to do all this. Our, our climate plan says we need to uh, uh, add another thousand people uh, working on um, this uh, transition from uh, uh, a high carbon community to a low carbon. As I've said, there's lots of work going on here. So we are building quite a bit on that. Um, really big digging into um, local food and trying to figure out ways that we can reduce um, food waste. Food waste accounts for about 30% of the total waste that goes into the downtown Hennepin Energy Recovery Center, the HERC. And so if we're going to ever get that thing transitioned out, we got to figure out how to take 30% of food out of that a waste stream. Um, really focusing on gr uh, greener buildings uh, and industry in Minnesota, I'm sorry, in Minneapolis, about 50% of our uh, our um, our carbon emissions come from commercial and industrial buildings with another 10 to 20% coming from residential buildings. So we have a much bigger percentage as a city than most because of the downtown and such. 
Um, and then looking at really new carbon-free en uh, uh, energy systems, such as ground storage, heating, and cooling. And we, there are a couple of projects that we're seeing uh, start up. Uh, one is at Sabathony Community Center. Um, I think they're going to start, they just uh, got some bond funding that is probably going to help push them over the edge to be able to implement that. And there's also one going on at Lake Street in Minnehaha um, around the uh, um, corner where the third precinct was. So that's going to do some also really good uh uh, building. I have a lot of stuff on here, but we all, these are kind of some of the big numbers that we want to hit by 2030, 5,000 insulated and weatherized homes. We're starting this year with 500. We normally do about 150. So uh, yeah, even getting to 500 is taking a, a pretty big lift, but we need to uh, get to 5,000 by 2030 is our goal. And then get through by, by, uh, by 2050 to get through all the remaining about 25,000 uh, homes that need that update. Um, we're really focusing on energy burden as a as a, a, a significant um, uh, cost that we are uh, that many of our lower income communities bear, and uh, we have about seventeen thousand households who have over six percent of their income uh, going to uh, heating and electric. And there's some really good stuff coming out on that. We actually just uh, there was an Excel Energy is working on basically reducing energy burden on the electric side. Um, to 4% or less um, as part of a, a, a kind of a compromise, not compromise, as part of a, a joint deal that came out of their equity uh, steering committee that's in front of the Public Utilities Commission right now. So I'm going to work through some of this stuff and, and then we'll touch on some of the remainder of it. But as I said, recycling and compost, 80% of our waste, if we can get there, we can close her. Um, we're pushing um, the city, uh, in our own enterprise, our own business, uh, to be uh, leading the way and being a, a, a champion um, and an innovator and working on pilots. We have established through this plan a goal to achieve net zero GHG emissions by 2040, 10 years ahead of the plan for the entire enterprise. We are currently at 100% renewable electricity uh, for our uh, uh, city operations and um, we are down about 50% on total energy use over the last 15 years. So we have been making some really good progress on that. You're probably seeing a lot of work around it. Um, enter more enterprise cars are being uh, electrified. Um, we're also being able to offer green cost share incentives and federal and state grants that have been coming in that can benefit the enterprise um, uh, very uh, easily. And, um, you know, much of these grants are kind of geared towards local governments, not just for themselves, but but to manage programs like the Green Cod Share, where the money goes out into the community. But in the past, city enterprises were not uh, necessarily eligible as much for those federal and state grants. And they've kind of gotten away, with, uh, moved on from that being like, you know, you federal or, or local governments aren't applicable. Um, lots of exciting things. I think you'll see in the next uh, couple of years, we're going to be, our goal is to uh, add 200,000 uh, new trees, uh, increasing our public uh, tree canopy by a third uh, over um, the next 10 years. And we did get an $8 million grant to help with um, uh, removal of ash trees on private property uh, and other tree types that are, are uh, need to be taken down and also then replanting. So we have an ability to basically use um, this funding on private property, which has never really been allowed before. So we're gonna be seeing uh, tens of uh, thousands of trees in that program also coming out. And we're doing a more sophisticated mapping of the trees now. So we're actually gonna create an inventory of all the new trees that are gonna be planted and they'll be monitored for you know, water and different things like that. So there's some very sophisticated software being done with that. So, and then also really pushing through CPEDS programs or passive and net zero energy homes. We have actually 17 passive net zero energy homes being built for families at below 80% of area median income this year. Um, it, there's a townhouse development, some really cool stuff. They look cool. They're not just totally modern. They look, you know, Victorian and different things or, you know, standard sort of four square with a big porch. So really cool showing that you can get to this um, uh, efforts. You can make these bones passive without them having to, you know, look like some, you know, super modern California home or something. 
Um, so to do all these things and to really kind of push our envelope uh, uh, open here, <laughs> we created the Climate Legacy Initiative, which establishes um, about $10 million a year in new dedicated funding, which goes to equitable climate action and work. Um, and that started in, in 2024. Uh, this, the, we, we were at about a $3 million budget. So this is uh, uh, triples the amount of money we had before. And, you know, do math, it's like four, four times overall, you know, because it's four times three. But yeah, so we've got now about $13 million, which is really a game changer for us uh, in regards to being able to, to do this. And we've got consistent funding, which we had a lot of roller coaster type funding. So um, the Climate Legacy Initiative is going to be supporting green career pathways. We have a really great program started up now by Marquita Keys. Um, we're going to be doing major incentives for renewable and energy efficiency in homes and businesses. And then I wanted to let you know that right now we have a program that can offer up to $14,000 in grants per household uh, for um, through our local green cost share program that's on top of any kind of federal incentives and utility rebates. And then we're filling any remaining gap with a 0% uh, loan pro loan that for 10 years. So basically we can pay for, e even if you're not eligible for some of the low income programs, we can help pay and finance um, the entire cost with little or no money out of pocket, um, including financing, for example, the tax credits, which you know, you have to take on a following year and taxes and what have you, we can finance that. So there's a great opportunity just started up right now uh, on our green cost share uh, website. Um, I mentioned we do a lot of policy development, community outreach and engagement on a number of our programs. Um, we're going to be doing a, we're working with eight different neighborhoods, launching a program on sustainability um, and really promoting that sort of program offering I had is kind of a new thing we got. Planting trees, carbon capture through biochar. Some folks, this is really cool. Uh, basically, it's using a, a, a anaerobic or non-oxygen high heat environment to uh, chemically change carbon um, to um, not basically keep it from biodegrading for 2,000 years. And it acts as a great... Um, uh, water retention as well. So mixing it in about a quarter uh, of, of, of a soil medium can really help plants grow. And so we're going to be taking all of the um, XL Energy's tree trimmings, which are currently going down to Chaska um, and diesel trucks. Um, and they will be going over um, by the University Southeast area over there, kind of by the sort of industrial area where, where the brewery is and stuff. And um, and that uh, we're going to have a, it's fairly small. It's like the size of a semi truck trailer, um, but it will be able to do 16,000 tons a year. So we're taking all, all the Excel Energy's tree trimmings around their power lines and stuff every year and putting it into this uh, carbon capture and storage. So if you that tree just fell down or was made into mulch, all the carbon will evaporate out as, as the, that deteriorates. And it only takes a couple of years really to get the majority of the carbon out. So this is a this is part of a circular economy because we can use that medium to help grow more plants. So works out great. And then I mentioned local food and food waste reduction. Um, uh, we're actually doing a press event on June fifth to talk about all kinds of new ways to do year round growing. We've changed regulation on whether you can have uh, uh, um, uh, greenhouses year round in your backyard. So some fun things there. And of course, all this information management of money and a lot of data and backing it into the plans is, is also part of it. So as you can see, here's kind of some of the um, different sort of breakdowns on that, about a million and a half going into uh, workforce. Um, so we're really building up our work with Sabathony and on the north side, we're working with a host of different organizations on multiple different kinds of uh, training programs. And we're working with the schools from kids from literally five to seniors in high school. Um, so this has really allowed us, this funding has really allowed us to expand what been kind of uh, limping along, shall we say, um, is now getting into where we're going to be starting to be able to educate hundreds of, of young people a year. So very good with that. 
mentioned our climate mitigation, the loan programs and stuff, the 0% financing. We're pushing around electrifications. We're actually able to uh, provide grant uh, money, uh, uh, matching grant money for uh, triple pane windows. So that's another thing that's never been available. It's not even, it's limited at the federal level. But um, with our lead and healthy homes efforts, we're combining. And rather than having people like the normal way, the least expensive way is you, you basically encapsulate the lead on windows with new paint. But, you know, the window is like a single pane window. So it's like, you know, the draft and everything. So we're like, wow, this is, you know, but all the restrictions kept us from actually being able to afford to redo the windows. We're going to be able to redo windows for the homes where we're uh, re doing lead remediation and now. So that's really uh, good. Um, we're pushing, obviously, uh, electrification. Um, the big thing we want to see happen now is we know we have a transition um, where we need to remove the use of fossil gas. So we're really hoping that we can have a hybrid system in which when people are looking to add or replace their air conditioning systems, instead of just air conditioning, you can get the same system to run in reverse and it can provide heating for about 80% of your heating load. Um, and therefore, with a 100% renewable electric uh, grid, which we'll have by 2030 in Minneapolis, basically you can use your carbon footprint from heating by 80%, but still have the gas backup uh, for those, you know, extreme cold events and, and that kind of thing. So we're, we're not, you know, we're transitioning, getting ready for full electrification, but it's going to take some time. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we have uh, good quality assurance going on because we're going to be we're supporting a, num a lot of growth here. And so we, we don't want to stumble in the early days and have to explain why things weren't going so well or some financial mishap or whatever. Um, policy and outreach, this is really the area that I uh, work a lot in um, and sort of lead up a lot. So we have uh, our advisory board coordination. And we're gonna have an additional um, working group for our implementation of the Climate Legacy Initiative. We're actually working on program marketing, which we've never done before. Uh, so um, we've always used all the money up very quickly. So it's like, well, I promote it, you know, but now we actually really want to do some deep dive promoting because we want to really start with, you know, uh, uh, the BIPOC community and and, and uh, new arrivals and things that normally we wouldn't go to because that's more difficult to connect in that community and et cetera. But we've got we've got now the consistency and the support to be able to do that. So our program marketing is going to really start taking off. And then we have a new program starting with a uh, industrial commercial innovation hub, which is really coming up while working with the university as well as a team of uh, national consultants and a group of about 10 other cities. Um, to come up with innovative ways to decarbonize uh, buildings mainly, but also then develop uh, side by side the, the regulatory components, which is a uh, uh, building performance standard for existing buildings that creates a uh, glide path to carbon neutrality by about 2040, if not before. So these are these are some new innovation programs we're going and we have applied for tens of millions of dollars of federal and state grants. So um, we're kind of excited. We haven't heard, we've got some things in, we've been doing pretty good, but just recently, for example, the state got a solar for all six, uh, grant for $65 million. So we're gonna be involved in, in getting our, our fair share of that as well too. And uh, yeah, we've got some big other ones that, that are coming in. Um, urban forestry is one of our early grants. We just got in $8 million from USDA. Uh, the Climate Legacy Initiative is putting in another $855,000. So we're really working on the private sector. The park board manages the, the, uh, the public sector side and the boulevards and things. Um, but uh, we've normally been giving out, we normally had about 1,250 trees a year that we provide through our tree program for $25 a tree. Um, but we're, we want to uh, quadruple that to 5,000 trees on private property here. So very exciting with that. And then carbon sequestration, as I mentioned, with the biochar. Um, this is actually a picture of uh, the gardens that were initially done um, with biochar. Um, and they were testing it actually in a number of different gardens, including at Little Earth. And it's just robust growth and stuff like that. So it's uh, really great. And the Bloomberg um, Foundation has taken a liking to this uh, 
and we've worked with them for the last four years and they have um, provided uh, free uh, technical assistance as well as they provided $600,000 grant to support this project. So we are extremely close to getting this off the ground. We just have a, a fairly small gap to fill, but it's planned to be up and running uh, by September 1st. And then homegrown Minneapolis is um, really about you know farmers markets, and here we uh, put in two hundred thousand um, to support some of their grant funded staff, as well as do urban agriculture grants and uh, change our policy, as well as support for year round growing, such as in our passive solar winter greenhouse, which we have developed with the University of Minnesota. So um, that's the this is we're going to be having a a. Uh, press conference with all the awardees on June 5th at 1.30. Um, not sure where it's at yet, but uh, to talk about these uh, new uh, grants we just had. So, and this talks about, our, as I mentioned, uh, data trafficking. We're also hiring someone who can coordinate um, between our weatherization and our lead and healthy homes and the funding between that, which is our healthy homes weatherization coordination. And then we're also looking to have an inter-enterprise project coordinator that's part of this, as well as uh, uh, director, manager, climate legacy funding, um, which I'll be working with closely and different things. But so these are some of the other additional folks we're going to have to keep this all moving along. Transportation, um, fun stuff going on here. We're doing uh, really looking at um, curbside EV stations and off-street uh, EV stations. And so this is going to help support uh, an EV project manager, which will be our first time ever we have that. And then we're also able to provide matching funds to a federal grant. So we're able to put in 624 from Climate Legacy. We got another 625 from federal funds now. So we can use that $1.2 million um, to help support uh, more um, curbside EV charging and expand actually our EV car share program, which has been very successful as well too, to move us past our 70, uh, right now is 35 square miles uh, to 75 square miles. So um, we're very excited about that. And this is in partnership uh, on the federal grant side with uh, St. Paul as well. So we've been really trying to coordinate that whole program. So I think this whole car share program is really gonna, it's been successful, but we're gonna really expand it to cover a lot more of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, and then uh, this is just a little bit of some of the funding that we've received um, so far. We've got an energy conservation grant of four, four and a quarter million. The city and I got eight million. The county I got ten for um, that. We have uh, eighteen million in grid, grid resilience and uh, resilient Minneapolis projects. We got a half a million dollars from EPA and MPCA to do air quality analysis and funding. So we have expanded all the air monitors going on. Um, we're going after about $20 million in EPA community change grants, and we're going after more than $200 million in climate pollution reduction grants that our applications are in. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we just heard the award a couple of weeks ago that the state was awarded $65 million uh, in solar for all. So this is a definitely make hay while the sun shines uh, opportunity going on here. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of why I wanted to run down everything. Um, fun picture of, uh, you know, the farmer's market on the Nicollet Mall, which unfortunately we're not having anymore. But we have our full climate equity website up there and this QR code, but also uh, we have a lot of new information on um, getting rooftop solar, um, which I didn't mention. I know you guys are always interested in, but um, we have right now about 4,000 uh, solar installations around the, in the city of Minneapolis. And our goal is to get to 15,000 by 2030. So we're really pushing hard. Um, and, you know, some of you know, Stacy Miller, I know, John, and, and, and of course, Doug do. Uh, but, uh, you know, she's been really trying to break down uh, barriers for interconnection and uh, those kinds of things as well, too. So we're, we're putting the stake in the ground. We can do it. It is feasible. It's going to, really, again, take a lot of uh, movement. But uh, the best thing that we're, I think we could do is see some help uh, eliminating barriers with our utility interconnections in which we, I just got the data today. 40% of the applications submitted to uh, Excel for interconnection are considered deemed uh, not complete. I'm like, wow, if you had a program like that, 
40% get rejected, maybe you ought to do some education about how people fill out the form or make it less complicated or something. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's a whole nother story, but I think we can do that. That's what we're really, we have a great opportunity. So um, there's a, a lot of opportunity with that, all of these fun programs. So, all right. Um, thank you very much. And I'm happy to um, answer any questions you may have. I kind of probably got a little overwhelming, but stuff. <laughs> but do I have audio? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, John. Okay. Hey, Kim. Uh, how about a quick update on uh, EV charging and multi unit dwellings? Okay. I know we've talked about that. that. Um, yeah. I know you and I know that's been a big challenge. Um, we do have it included in the climate equity plan to work with. It is also um, something that um, we have uh, put in our uh, work plan with the Clean Energy Partnership and specifically working with Excel. Um, the reality is though we don't have a, we don't have a, a solution at this point in time to figure out how to get over that um, limitation of power capacity and, and who's responsible for for paying for those costs. Um, I think we're gonna have more opportunity once we start seeing uh, more implementation on like how we deal with EV charging in general, which like I said, we never had anyone. But unfortunately, I don't have any good news to share that's a, a major a change from where we're at other than we've identified as an issue and we need to figure out how to work on it. Hello, I'm Chris Berta, and I, Hi. it all was, you gave a, you know, such an uplifting presentation on just about everything. I, I guess I'm interested in hearing what are some of the pitfalls, like you just started to mention, where are the hard spots, things that uh, an organization like ours can, um, I don't know, likes to think about those problems, you know, the challenges that you're facing. You know, mm -hmm. the interconnectivity, you know, keeping the goal going. Um, and also, uh, like, you know, the newspaper uh, headline today is DFLers attempt to overturn solar solar rulings on community uh, solar gardens and, you know, the mm -hmm. rates and stuff like that and what how that's going to go with the vote. And, you know, what are, what are your what are some of your challenges? Yeah, you know, um well, I'll, I'll say our, our biggest challenge where we, we really don't have an identified path is decarbonizing uh, the use of fossil gas and natural gas. Um, I actually think it's going to be harder to decarbonize homes than it will be industry because industry, you're working with such a, you know, we, we know the top 50 industrial, you know, gas users, you know, uh, but there's 88,500, you know, uh, single family or duplex homes, you know, detached homes in Minneapolis. So that is going to be the biggest challenge. So the 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 need to continue to push and support um, electrification and, and weatherization for everyone so that the we can all use less energy and therefore it becomes easier to transition off of gas. Um, I'll also be honest with you, I, uh, you know, I get a lot of pushback from other departments in the city of Minneapolis. They I, the biggest one is is CFED. So um, is what is the community planning and economic development group oh. of CPED. Um, I've been trying to get them for the last six months to do a, a study to figure out how we can create the city's first uh, carbon neutral development, Nicolet, Nicolet and Lake, which is about 10 acres of space and I cannot get any support from them at all, <laughs> even when I offer to pay for it. Um, and I bring in professionals who give a two pager and rundown about how this is working and how we're doing it in St. Paul at the Heights, you know, it's called. Yeah. Um, so honestly, if you guys wanted to make a difference, 
we have until February before they're issuing their like developer bid thing to get this somebody on the city council or somebody on CPAD to change course and say, we're going to agree to try to get us to carbon neutral. We're not, we don't have to do it like immediately. Um, you know, like it doesn't have to be like the minute it opens, but why wouldn't we do this so that we can go into it by like 2030 or something? You know what I mean? And I just, I have the same, I got the same pushback from Upper Harbor and they were, they were like, yeah, you're too late. That ship left sailed. And I was like, so I said, I'm not going to let that happen again. So I've been pushing for six months and they just okay. did not do it. Is there something you can write up and send to Doug that he can share with us about that particular issue? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at what's happening. Lauren, why did you tell him what, what you're doing and, and why is that? A, does it apply to what he's after? Well, well it sounds like um, Minneapolis itself is producing its own electricity. Um, no, we don't produce our own electricity. It's, it's XL Energy. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're in XL Energy territory, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I was yeah. thinking and, of all the things that you were mentioning to me the other day, like the dark sky, um, oh. lighting, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, Warren lives out west of here. Why don't you describe it, Warren? Yes, it's a smaller town of Wayzata, so it's easier, I guess, to manage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we just put on solar panels on all city-owned buildings. So that will produce most of our electricity. Oh, that's great. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, we have a lot of, we've been trying to do that too. And we, um, we've had a couple of unfortunately failures just because we have a lot of older housing stock or building stock and a lot of mm -hmm. it has to be structurally reinforced and the new roof put on. And so honestly, sure. there's another thing. There's another thing you could work on. I, the, the struggle, I the, I have great allies with the energy manager who's in property services, but he doesn't have any money to work with. Like he gets $3 million to maintain like 62 buildings. So it's, you know, we can't do anything creative without getting like a mega grant. So we're actually starting a decarbonization study now um, with the enterprise, uh, also funding from the Climate Legacy Initiative to kind of create a pathway how we do this. Because with property services, it's like there's this CLIP project, the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee, and they look at things like five years out. So if we don't have something in that's going to like upgrade the building from or decrease gas use in like the budget five years in advance, you can't get it done, you know what I mean? So we have to come up with new money every time you want to say like, wow, the furnace went out and they're like, you, basically what we can do is replace what's there. They yeah. have no money to like be investing in upgrading to like electric boilers, for example, yeah. you know? So that's another challenge. Yeah. I know in the city's under all this tight financial stuff, we are going to provide some more money to them, but it's going to take a real look at like how we're investing our own money in our own buildings um because uh if we want to get to 2040 uh we're kind of barely you know maintaining at this point is what what some of the issues are with our our city buildings too so internally can, it, can you can you go yeah. off the screen share so we can see each other oh can you close down sure. the screen share sorry yeah hey kim i have a question um what is the difference or is there uh, like with St. Paul with the heights there that seems to be moving right along is it I mean are they getting different types of funding or no um Minneapolis is a lot more capacity to fund that kind of stuff than St. Paul is I mean they have an 800 million dollar budget we have a 1.7 billion dollar budget <laughs> so it's on a completely different uh, level of funding that we can bring in. I mean, the reason I'm, I'll be honest with you is they have that port authority who is very forward thinking and they have a mayor who is, I'm not saying our mayor is committed to stuff, but th they have a the mayor there is like, go for it, you know? And, um, uh, and with that port authority, which is, you know, our CPED, um, they are really pushing to do this. They want, to be known for this kind of stuff. So they lead with that. We seem to be reluctant to lead with, with sustainability, even though we're, you know, they're number 25 on the American, the 
the American Council on Energy Efficient Economies ranks us sixth, and we're, we've been in the top 10 for six years, and they were at like 50, and they're at like 25 now. We're the only state other than, only city other than Denver that's not on the coast who's been in the top 10 uh, for the last five, six years. So well, we should be able to do that. I mean, honestly, I think it's basically just reluctance to uh, lean into it. You know, it's just like risk avoidance or something. Are the are the green zones? I mean, are they getting they're getting some additional support to do things, right? Absolutely, yeah. We prioritize funding for them. We give a uh, higher uh, higher um, portion of funding. We can go to forty percent for green zone projects. We actually have used the green zones to be identified with uh, as anything in our green zones has now been approved by the PUC and Excel and Center Point to be eligible for all low income. Uh, utility rebates and benefits without having to do income verification. So we got that done last year, which basically means anybody in the green zones can get access to, in many cases, almost 100% of the funding to redo the, to weatherize and electrify. Awesome. Yeah, uh, Peter, so good. Peter, you've got a question there, I see. Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Question is, I live in a condo building, um, four stories, opened in 2004. Each unit has its own natural gas burning furnace. I'm wondering, they'll be soon be due for replacement. How do we, for instance, my case, what do we, con convincing the homeowners board and convincing them they need to get away from natural gas into something like, say, electricity or some other, some other form of heating. Do you, do you have so we would need a central support. air conditioning system with yeah. the furnace? No. No. Um, okay. Each 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 unit, each apartment is individually heated and cooled. Okay. Do you have like a heat pump to do the, or a, a air conditioner thing to or is it a window air conditioning? Um it's a wind it's um I think the hot air blows outside. It's connected to a grid outside the window. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, one of the great ways to be able to, to, to reduce the dependence on the, yeah, I mean, you have to look at it. It might be a little, a little complicated, but one of the kind of new technologies that are used um, is they're called mini splits. They, you may have seen them. They're, uh, they look like a rectangular kind of white box that has like fans that flip up. And they are similar to what your air conditioning unit is. So they have an outside exposure. And so they're able to heat and cool using a compressor, just like your air conditioner, but they can go both ways. Okay. So they can also heat. So you can use those kind of things to really decarbonize like 80% of your heating. Um, I'm not sure how your What's furnace the... works or how old it is. But one of the things if you did do this uh, is that you'd be using your furnace a lot less and so probably could get a little more lifetime out of it. Um, that's why I'm talking about the hybrid system as well. I mean, if you had a, a, a duct worked, um, yeah, you could still even, I mean, you could actually get rid of the, I'm just thinking what you could do. And John is probably, Don Lop is a little more experienced for this, but you could probably, if your furnace is going out, you can get the uh, air source heat pump that also has, uh, the resistance heating coils, which we're known at, to, if you need to really power it out, you know what I mean, uh, where you're not able to use uh, inner source heat pump. The technology okay. can go down to at least 20, maybe to zero, but it's, oh, it's always good in Minnesota to have that uh, extra. So those are two okay. options. To look at. Briefly, what are those two things called again? Uh, and uh, the It's called a mini split uh, air and heating system. And then okay. the other is an air source heat pump with resistance heating. And what's the second one called again? Mini split and then what? An one air source one. heat pump okay. with resistance heating. Because then if you had that resistance heating, you could get rid of the furnace. But otherwise, you could use the furnace if you have the, you know, uh, if you can do the duct work Thanks. stuff. Mm -hmm. I may want to contact your office sometime. Maybe yeah. in the future sometime. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Kim, are you uh, 
creating projects in Minneapolis, uh, getting into geothermal, because that seems to be a new push now to do geothermal, but to, to go down and, and you know, uh, uh, not connect to, but get uh, in the area of the aquifer and mm -hmm. use that is uh, Darcy, I think, is a project. Great. Group. Yeah, Darcy is the name of, of a local company. Yeah, that uh, they have. Uh, yes, we are looking at two projects, both of which would use a Darcy system. Um, and one is at Sabathany Community Center. And I'm happy to report that they got $5 million in bond funding um, approved in the House and Senate Conference Committee. Uh, they've got $5 million already they've raised, uh, and they were able to get about 50% of it covered from uh, tax credits and stuff. So they're going to be doing about an $18 million project that will also be able to be hooked into other buildings along 38th Street. So they're only, you know, they're 4th Avenue and 38th Street. So they're about six seven blocks from George Floyd Square. Uh, wow. And the idea is to use Sabathony's parking lot, which is really big, um, as sort of the where the um, wells would be drilled and then pump it out into the um, street right of way. And across from them is one of the Seward Co-op groceries they want in. And then the city owns, I don't know, I think it's number 12 or something. That we have, a, we have a, a, a fire station right next to the, Sabathony as well. So we would hook into it. And then the idea is to run it down and you can hook in different wells, which is kind of the unique thing about the Darcy system is that you can add on to it. It's sort of, a, you know, pieces that you just can connect to. And the big vision, which is, you know, Julia Eagles, I don't know if you know her with Institute for Market Transformation. She was with Excel for a long time. She has this vision to create the carbon-free community neighborhood down between George Floyd Square and Sabathony. Yeah. So that one is looking to happen um, starting next year. And then the other one is at the Coliseum building on Lake Street in Minnehaha. Um, it would be the Coliseum building, Seward Redesigns building, another 250 units of housing right there. And then there, um, you know, with, with that whole neighborhood community area around that target and everything. Um, and that, there used to be a U.S. Bank building. That actually is where the new like 250 unit housing projects going in for, with Seward Redesign. So yeah, and that is an all the, the um, I worked with um, uh, Ali, uh, um, uh, Alisa, Alicia Belton. Um, she was one of um, our consultants put the climate equity plan. She's an African-American woman and her and an architect and her and two other business women, black women are the ones that bought and are renovating the Coliseum building. And they are going to be awesome. a, a major that's, anchor to that. That's system. awesome. And that is funded. That 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 system is funded. Uh, that to put it in, and it'll be done by Evergreen, which is the folks that manage the St. Paul District Energy. Okay. Any yeah, other? that's supposed to be done by twenty seven. <clears throat> okay. Well, every time you've reported in the past and now, I mean. As usual, there's challenges, but there's also some good news in there. So that's what's great. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> the work yes, there is doing. really good news. I'm, yes, thank you. I do think we're we're in a kind of a we're really in, like I said, the this is this is the best I've ever seen it. I've been in, in working in the environment and on so renewable energy and stuff like this for 20 years. I've never experienced it where the local government, the state government, and the federal government are all in alignment right now on this climate change stuff. You know what I mean? It's like you're always fighting off somebody, but no, all three major governments are in alignment, Hennepin County, of course, too. So this is, uh, you know, been really it's impressive. So we can do this. Uh, it's not a technologically impossible thing to achieve, but it, it is a, uh, requires a lot of transition. Um, so of what we're focusing on and, and also political will to, to, push forward, even though there might not be a 100% clear pathway how to get there. It's still worth making. In my opinion, that's a, that's what I do. <laughs> I set these goals out there based on what we need to do instead of like, well, what we can do. I'm not negotiating with what, what we can do. That's not going to get us where we need to go. So I'm the person that needs to be able to set the, like I say, put the stake in the ground and say, here's where we really need to go. Let's figure it out. It's not like, you know, 
it's impossible if we put our heads together, you know, so. So how, so um, how dependent are these goals on, on the election, the upcoming November election? Uh, well, you know, the nice thing is that the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act uh, were very well designed to avoid uh, repealing it. Um, so those benefits now go through 2032. So instead of like two year extension, which, you know, is what they did to solar for like 10 years, you know, it's like, oh, two years and it drops off and then two years and then drops off. So now yes. we have, you know, a full, I mean, basically it was like 10 years through, through 2032. So I don't, you know, unless they can figure out how to repeal that, it's a lot of it is tax credit. And mm -hmm. that's why the, also I will say the Biden administration is really pushing to get big money out the door, you know? So, uh, because once it's out and contracted for, it's impossible to sort of claw back. But if it hasn't been spent, you know, that's something they can pull back or they can change to say the tax credits are phasing out. So that's why it's like, they want to push that money out, but it's it's pretty challenging to get uh, the stuff repealed. I, it's not going to help though, because of course, what happens is we're going to have well, we even heard right. He's willing to sell, uh, basically crash the IRA program for a billion dollars from the oil industry. Um, and I think he would do that. <laughs> so, they were horrible. There was like a mass exodus out of DOE and EPA when Trump was in office. I'm surprised it withstood the brutality kim what what one thing i've wondered you know uh mcgizzy and uh oh my gosh that restaurant in the area that were burnt down during the rioting is oh, that no. is yeah is that area under redevelopment or what's happened there um i don't know about the county mahal specific related stuff um uh, I mean, the good news, hopefully, with this new, they're on that corner also that would benefit from the geothermal exchange system. Um, yeah. It's, it is a lot. There was uh, something like 1700 buildings that were either partially or fully destroyed. And, it, you know, everyone is different because like, did you have insurance? And what was it for? And does this count? And then, you know, Lake Street Council has been been pretty flush with giving out additional funding, but even at, you know, I think they raised like $30 million. Again, 1,700 buildings, that's not, <laughs> and we struggle too. I mean, the city's put in millions, but so it's, uh, and then you got ownership and who controls it and da 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 da, da. So it's really challenging um, uh, to, to, to try to get through all that. So um, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, if you looked at what happened in the, civil rights riot, which was before my time, but up on Plymouth Avenue, um, you look at historic pictures on uh, stuff, uh, you know, it took decades to to rebuild from that situation. And so, and it's challenging as you know, uh, in the commercial um, world right now, uh, retail is, is not expanding and it's just really challenging to make a, make a living off of, uh, you know, storefront retail in the age of, uh, DoorDash and Amazon. Yep. yep. So, well, um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks so much for asking questions. Um, I really do think there's an opportunity to push hard on our, our bigger uh, folks, continue to work hard on getting Excel to reduce barriers to uh, uh, local solar, uh, push hard to get center point to look for really new ways to decarbonize, not just sort of like, oh, we'll offer a couple of new rebates. No, you got to fundamentally change how things are working here. Uh, and you have to push the city too, to keep their feet to the fire. Cause it's not, it's, it's, it's I mean, there's not enthusiasm throughout the enterprise. Uh, and this is just one more pile, a thing to pile on as they look at it. Uh, and so um, again, that Nicola Lake situation, I think has great opportunity, but unless we get it into the development agreement, it's, you know, it's a nice to have as far as the developer will see it. <clears throat> yeah. So thanks so much. Um, yeah, and good any, luck with the any, experience and the boat regatta. Yeah, thank you. Any uh, final questions? Yeah. Anybody? 
just uh, give us an assignment. <laughs> what of the boat regatta? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like pressure, I'll I'll follow up with Doug with a call with you. But uh, you know, I don't want to. I have to be a little careful working at the city, you know, blah, 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 about who I'm pushing. But um, I do think there's a lot of influence that can happen from groups like yours on city projects and on utility projects. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot more challenging trying to go after individual businesses or even knowing, you know, like, what are you going to go after industrial businesses? You know, it's like, it's a challenge. So the where you have influence is where, uh, you know, there's that connection that's with the utilities and our, our city uh to um and of course the federal government but locally where you can have a big influence is to keep pushing hard for things like you know carbon free standards and pushing the city to take more chances and and pilot programs and and be a champion for this so there you can have a lot of in influence on it kim do you just kind of a sideways question but do you have mm -hmm. any ideas with i mean like with the with the transit system and how that's affecting any of your programs i mean does that it is does it help or does it sometimes i know a while back you talked about how you were designing things so there was places where people could ride their bike get on a bus uh charge up mm -hmm. their electric car all that yeah. is is that still all happening no, um, that that was a pilot program that did not uh, succeed and, and was grant funded. So um, we are pivoting more to, we're trying to do that as we're creating more um, EV charging areas, you know, um, but that mobility hub concept is, is not, uh, is not being fully rolled out so we kind of pivoted to the uh, of doing the uh, EV car sharing the ev car sharing program and that therefore we're going to put in public chargers for those and expand that area um but uh unfortunately um you know we just we just we just couldn't get that concept to to uh to catch on basically <clears throat> i have one more question sorry um, do you do you know is the Cedar Riverside area of Minneapolis is that a green zone? Yes. Um, Midwest Mountaineering, which is the, the building, is owned by Rob Johnson. He mm -hmm. owns that whole building, and he wants to turn it into um, uh, housing, low income mm -hmm. or middle income mm -hmm. housing. Um, mm -hmm. Just just letting you know that I just wondered if he doesn't know. I asked him, you know, does he know, know anything about the infrastructure bill and the IRA? He doesn't. He's mm, kind okay. of clueless about it, so you might reach out. Oh, Rod interesting. Rod Johnson. Bob Johnson from... Uh, no, Mr. Rod. Rod, Rod. okay. R-O-D yeah, Johnson I was, is the owner. Yeah. I always, um, I always like that place a lot. I just go in there to look at stuff, you know. His cell number yeah. is 12481. 6947. One, I'm sorry, 612 481. 481 69407. Just to what's let the, it know, like what's available to him or any assistance. Yeah. Absolutely. Might, might work into a bigger plan that you have for the area. Yeah. Hmm. Excellent. Good to know. Well, Kim, thank you so very much. This is, as usual, I, I know when you presented uh, at the ACES conference here in the Twin Cities, we got a lot of feedback on how, uh, how positive you were and how much good thing, how many good things were happening in the Minneapolis area. And it's just, uh, it, it sounds like it's still happening, but you know, it's, uh, it's challenging along the way. <laughs> it sure so, is. But we need groups and people like you to consistently be there backing us staff people up to get you know what I mean it, it's a mm -hmm. it's a group effort so and there's lots of challenges as we know and other competing interests and public safety and all these things that um you know sometimes if it's not like immediate impact like climate's like oh don't worry about it today it'll be fine well a thousand days go by and now it's not fine anymore you know it's uh, 10 degrees warmer than you thought it was uh, and, and you don't have any snow so we got to keep this on that it's 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 not um, 
we know it's not immediate, but it's something that needs to be addressed and we have a hard time sometimes dealing with being able to get out of the immediate reaction and, and be able to push initiatives long-term. So yeah, thank you, sure. everyone. Thank, uh, thank, you, thank you. MRES thank people, you. We're, we're at 7.30, Mark said, uh, for the board meeting. So Kim, thank you again. Appreciate All it. All right, take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.